Over the last couple of weeks, we've been focusing on Second Timothy, excuse me, Second Corinthians, chapter five, verse seventeen. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away, and everything, or all things, or behold, the new things come. The responsibility to make these new things come lies with us. When we come up out of the water of baptism, we are a new creation. Old things have certainly passed away. Our sins are gone. We are no longer dead in sin. We are prepared to go to heaven. But it's all by grace. We haven't done anything yet. We haven't made any changes yet. God has made all of the changes. And I think that's why God tells us in Romans chapter 12 that we need or we are responsible for the metamorphosis. God does all of the work. God does all of the uh, difficult things that we couldn't do. But the new things, in order for them to come, we have to have a big part of whether that happens or not. I wanted to start... uh, with an illustration this, this, this evening. As the life of a caterpillar draws to a close, but before it begins its life as a butterfly, it goes through a process of transformation. It's a butterfly, but before it's a butterfly, it's a caterpillar. It lives its life in two different forms. And God takes that particular parable or illustration and puts it into Romans chapter 12. And so the same creature that begins its life in one body with one set of skills, right in the middle of that life, completely changes its form and has to develop a brand new set of skills. It comes out as something that crawls on the ground. It becomes something that flies. It begins its life eating leaves and eating vegetation. It ends its life, or its second part, eating the nectar out of the flowers. And the process by which it does that is incredibly complicated. When you look at, I'm I'm going to kind of go back and forth here, but I think you get a general idea of what a caterpillar looks like, and then it comes out like that. Now, if you didn't see that, could you believe it? Could you believe that God could create a caterpillar and let it grow for, what, two, three months? Grow into its adult form as a caterpillar? And then make its own cocoon. And in the process... From what I understand, it completely liquefies and then reforms into something entirely different. And this particular butterfly then has within it an organ of sight that will allow it to travel a thousand miles from where it became a butterfly to where it will live its life. And it will get there unerringly every time. And when you think about God's creative genius, because this is what it does. It starts its life right down here. And you can see the scale of miles. So what is that? 500 to there, then another 500. These develop an organ that we have to develop We're doing something very similar. We start our lives as material beings in a body that we have misused and abused and God doing the same or very similar thing as what happens with the butterfly through the water of baptism, we become a new creation. Just like that butterfly becomes a new creation. It was a caterpillar. It becomes a butterfly. We are dead in sin and trespasses. We are defiled. We are ungodly and corrupt. And as Paul said to the Ephesians, by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But when we enter the water of baptism, we join Christ. We are buried with him. We die with him. 
We are crucified with him and we are resurrected with him and we are raised to walk in newness of life. Or as Paul concludes it in Ephesians chapter 2, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which he afore prepared that we should walk in. The big difference between a caterpillar and a butterfly and a sinner and a saint is free will. That butterfly is programmed by God. It has no choice in the matter. God has done whatever is necessary for that egg to produce the caterpillar, for the caterpillar to grow to a certain point and form a cocoon, for the cocoon to, while in the cocoon, for it to change into a butterfly with wings and beauty and then come out of that and have the ability to travel. I mean, if you looked at this thing right here and you said, you know something? In about six months, this is going to be 1,500 miles away. What would you say? There's no way. There's no way that thing could go 1,500 miles. Well, you're right. There's no way that thing could go 1,500 miles. Well, what about this? Well, if I were looking at that, I'd probably say the same thing. I don't know how that thing could go 1,500 miles, but they do. They do it all the time. And so what we need to appreciate about this is that this creature, this insect, with very little intelligence and very little ability, has the, in, the, has the ability, the organ of sight, to be able to travel 1,500 miles unerringly. And we see this all the time with birds. We see, I don't know if you've watched these nature programs, but you see these birds. Every year, they migrate. 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles this way. 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles this way. Back and forth, back and forth. You know, brother, we don't even think about it. But if you did think about it, isn't God a master architect, craftsman, engineer, designer, and creator? Like I said, if we didn't see this happen, we would proclaim. That's impossible. It's impossible for something like that to happen. But that's the amazing thing about God. God makes the impossible not only possible, but then he makes, he makes it look natural and easy. Well, that's just normal. It's just normal for a baby to form in the womb, for a child to begin and bones be formed. And as, as the psalmist put it, I am fearfully and marvelously made. And so I'd like to take just a second here to praise and honor and glorify God for his infinite wisdom, for his ability to do that, not just with the monarch butterfly, but with thousands of different varieties of butterflies and birds, and it just goes on and on and on what God can do with this little insect programming it, we don't know how, to be able to do the impossible. The metamorphosis of a bee is very similar. We could have used the same basic step-by-step -step process to talk about how a bee, which isn't even supposed to be able to fly, and God is just great. But I'm not here to talk about butterflies and caterpillars. I'm not here to talk about birds or bees. I want to talk about what happens to you and I when we come up out of the water of baptism and the potential the potential that God has given to us, which sadly many Christians never reach because as Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, they don't add on their part. God did his part. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us the precious and exceedingly great promises. But if we don't add on our part, this new organ of sight that... The butterfly has, we have it too. We have the ability to see the unseen. We have the ability to have the eyes of our heart enlightened. We have the ability to walk by faith, not by sight. We have the ability to, like our forefathers, to not have received the promises, but seeing them and greeting them and embracing them and confessing, I'm a stranger to pilgrim. You see this guy right here? One of these days, he's going to be in heaven with God. You say, ah, that's not possible. No, it's very possible. Because that's how God did it. 
The only problem and the only variable here, because as I said, I'm like an animal and like an a insect, we've got free will. We can disrupt the process any time we want to. We can stop the process. We can reverse the process and go right back to where we started, like the dog returning to its vomit or like the pig to washing in the mire. So transforming a sinner into a saint is far more complicated and far more amazing. We don't even, I don't even have a point of reference. At least with a butterfly, you can say, here's the caterpillar, here's the butterfly, here's the route it takes, here it is here, here it is here. Oh, okay, well that perfectly makes sense. Because I can see it. Matter of fact, that's normal and natural. We see it all the time. What about me? You know, we see the easy part. We see the person going down into the water and coming out. Just like we see the easy part. We see the caterpillar make its cocoon. We see the, the, the butterfly come out of the cocoon. What happens in between? Well, I can't explain it. No one can explain it. We don't know how the caterpillar can transform into a butterfly. We couldn't begin to figure out how it was done, and we certainly couldn't figure out how to replicate it. So just like we see the easy part of the caterpillar, we see the easy part, but what is happening in between is incredible. I don't know how to describe the fact that God said, in the water of baptism, I'm buried into his death. Now, in his death is where the blood is. Matter of fact, the blood and the death are used synonymously in a lot of cases because the life is in the blood. And we, re we learn in the book of Leviticus that God created the animal blood. He said, I have given you this for atonement. Though you, so you can't eat it. It has been given to you for a very specific purpose. Well, the life is in the blood. When I'm buried with him in baptism, my dead life touches his living life, and I become alive. I was dead, now I'm alive. Old things have passed away, everything's become new. These are not just symbols. Something happens in the water of baptism. I die with him, I'm buried with him, I'm raised with him, I'm crucified with him. The old man is put off, the new man is put on. You know, if you apply that to a caterpillar, you can visualize it. The old man is put off. The new man is put on. He goes into a cocoon with an old man. He comes out of the cocoon as a new man. And yet, we can't even begin to comprehend. But I think there's some illustrations there that we need to ponder and carefully consider. Because the amazing result is, when I come up out of the water of baptism, I'm God's product. The word workmanship here comes from the Greek word, and it basically means the same thing when we use the word manufacturing. You take a raw material, you put it into a machine, and it comes out as their workmanship. Whether it's a TV or a car, whether it's a phone or a computer, it goes in and it is worked on and it comes out. That's the workmanship. We're the same thing. We are his workmanship. When did it happen? Well, I hesitate to say it all happens in baptism because it starts with faith and then it moves to repentance and confession. And then finally, we enter the water of baptism where all of those things come together and we become his workmanship. But then the interesting point he makes here is where this factory is. You know, you could say the butterfly is created in the cocoon. You could say that the television is created at the factory. And you can say the Christian is created in Christ Jesus. And we, when we're buried with him, you remember Paul saying this in Galatians 3.27, every one of you has been baptized into Christ, has put on Christ. We are buried with him in baptism. It's incredible. And I wish we could get so excited about it. It's amazing. I, I like the reason I took that picture. I mean, I brought that picture here. Is I, just, I just love to look at that. And it causes my heart to soar. And I look to God and I say, my God, how great you are. I can't even conceive how you could have even thought this up, let alone made it happen and made it happen so many times that we just say, well, it's just the way it is. It's normal. It's not. 
Springtime's the same thing. We watch the metamorphosis of these dead trees that put on leaves, they put on flowers, they put on fruit. You look at that dead tree, say, you know, in six months, there's going to be apples on that tree. Ah, oh, it's not possible. Well, yeah, it is possible. So when we're in Christ, we were created in Christ. While we were in the water of baptism, God was doing things, things we can't comprehend. And if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, again, I know what that means with a butterfly versus a caterpillar. I know what it means with the, the bee as a grub and the bee as an adult. I understand all that. But this is a little more complicated. Like the butterfly. God designed a butterfly to fly. New predators now. Got to be concerned about new predators. God has to design that butterfly so that that butterfly knows where to go at night. That butterfly knows how to fly. He knows how to eat. He knows how to do all the things that he does. And God did the same thing with us. But like I said, unlike the butterfly who has no free will, God's given us a fellowship. And what I have by grace when I come up out of the water of baptism means nothing until I make it mine. I'm righteous in the sight of God, but now I have to start putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And I have to start working, adding on my part, setting my mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, putting to death my members on the earth. All of these things bringing about what Paul says in if Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is be not conformed, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we've got to do the same thing as that butterfly. I don't know if the caterpillar has a homing device within it that would allow it to go from Mexico to California or from Mexico to Colorado. I don't know if it's in him then, but I do know that it's not doing anything for him while he's running around all those leaves eating the, eating the, the leaves. But once that butterfly comes out of the cocoon, it has the ability to see and sense what's around it, but it also has the ability to see and sense where it needs to go. So butterflies and caterpillars can do it, and God's power is seen every time they do it. Now, you and I have the same opportunity. It's not given to us on a silver platter like it is the butterfly. Butterfly just comes out of the cocoon ready to fly 1,000 miles or 1,500 miles unerringly going exactly where he's supposed to go. Paul prayed that God would help those in Ephesus develop the new ability to see and navigate in this world. And so it says, making mention you of my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. I don't know if there's a scientific name for whatever the organ is. I don't even know if they understand how a butterfly or a bird can navigate like they do and know exactly where they're going and know exactly which way to go. If you sent me on an 1,800-mile 18 mile, 1, trip without a map, there's no telling where I'd end up because I wouldn't know. It's not in man that walks to direct his step. Spin me around a few times and say, go north, and I'm going to say, I don't know where north is. Can't do that with a butterfly. Can't do that with a bird. They have an organ that allows them to redirect and understand and know exactly where they need to go. It is in them to know which direction to go. But I have the ability to develop that ability or organ or whatever you want to call it. The, the new eyes, I guess we could call it that. The eyes of my heart. So like the butterfly, God has made it possible for you and I to have an organ of sight so that we can find our way to heaven. You know, we talk about homing pigeons. Once again, how do they do that? How can you take a pigeon how can a dog get lost a thousand miles from home and somehow, remember the incredible journey, somehow it finds its way back? Well, you know something, brethren? We have the ability to find our way home. 
We have our ability to find our way right back to God. But we've got to put it there. And we've got to trust it after we put it there. So as Jesus said, the eye of the body, or excuse me, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, do you, does anybody here think he's talking about your physical eyes? Is that what he's talking about here? The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Proverbs put it a little different. He says the way of the righteous is as the rising of the sun. And the way of the wicked is as darkness and they don't know what they're stumbling over. There's another proverb that says the fool, excuse me, the righteous sees the danger ahead and retreats. The fool goes on. So what about us? Can you see where this is going to end? That's what the scriptures give us the opportunity to be able to do. They give us the opportunity to be able to see, if I go this way, this is what's going to happen. If I go this way, then this is what's going to happen. But you know something? We can't do any of these things until our new eyes have developed. So we've got to learn how to develop the eyes of our heart. And we've got to have the ability to trust those new eyes. You know something? Sometimes my spiritual eyes are telling me something that my physical eyes can't believe. Because I haven't reached it yet. I can read it in the scriptures. But my body and my, my mind and my, my, the darkness that is still in me, I say to myself, this doesn't feel like the right way, even though the scriptures say it's the right way. So we've got to learn how to trust our new eyes. Because... We have to walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, I have to stop trusting these things altogether. Just like I guess the caterpillar has to do. Just like the bird has to do. I have to do it. And we ought to be able to say, well, if, if God did it for the birds, if he did it for the butterflies, if he did it for the bees, if he did it for, and we could just go on and on and on about all the different creatures that he did it for, then why would it be so hard for us to understand that he's done it for us? Here's what happens when the eyes of your heart are enlightened. We do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That's a contradiction, isn't it? How do you see what you can't see? Well, there's two eyes. There's the eyes and there's the eyes. The eyes of your heart, the eyes of your body. We do not look at the things which are seen, Paul says. We've stopped using our physical eyes. You know, he must have done that pretty quickly because he did a lot of things that don't make any sense at all and that we would kind of be thinking, man, I don't know if I want to do that or not. Sacrifices he made, the troubles he brought on himself, the persecutions, the tribulations, the losses, the zeal, the determination, the effort, the sacrifice. If we could get going as quickly as he did, we would have the opportunity to go as far as he did. Remember what he said in Philippians? One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and stretching forward to the things that are ahead, I press on toward the goal for the upward price, excuse me, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We don't look at the things that are seen. If we don't know how he does that, then we've got some work to do. We don't look at the things which are, which are seen. We look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. But the things that are not seen are eternal. That's what God did for me and you in the water of baptism. He gave us this new organ of sight. He gave us the ability. And of course, you say, well, it's just the word of God. Well, no, it's not just the word of God. It's the word of God that is now being used by me to unerringly go in the direction God wants me to go. Not zigzagging. Like Paul said, I'm not buffeting. I'm not beating the air. When I'm fighting, I see exactly what I need to do. 
When I need to have self-control, I know exactly what needs to be destroyed. So when they are fully developed, the eyes of our heart have the ability to replace what is seen with what is not seen. And once that happens, all of these things that Jesus say that the world mocks and scoffs at, we hold as basic, fundamental, absolute truth. <clears throat> so, to me, after witnessing what a metamorphosis of a caterpillar, a caterpillar into a butterfly can do, I understand. I understand what the potential is here. The only limitation, of course, is my ability and your ability to get busy and do it. We could do it. If a butterfly can do it, I can do it. If the grace of God and the power of God have allowed this little grub to become something that can travel 1,500 miles and unerringly end up where it's supposed to go, then I need to have that confidence. So we don't understand... Again, the two organs, the bird and the butterfly, I don't, I don't know. I know they can see when, when a bird goes by, if he sees a bug, he can grab it and he can eat it. Well, that's these organs. But then when he leaves, he travels a thousand miles. He's not using these anymore. He's using something else. We know they see. We also know they can see that. So what about us? In the world, we only see the temporary and the material until we become a Christian. And then God says, I've got a new organ here for you. I've got this organ of sight, the eyes of your heart. I want you to enlighten them. Paul prayed that they would be enlightened. Maybe we should be praying that our eyes would be enlightened so that we can see these things. Because it's fascinating to me how some Christians have the ability to do things that other Christians are terrified to do or other Christians don't have the commitment or the conviction to do. And I think to myself sometimes, I wonder what the difference is between this one and this one. You can chart it out in the Old Testament. You look at the 600,000 people who came out of Egypt after seeing the 10 plagues and then you look at Joshua and Caleb who said, and this is a piece of cake. This isn't a problem. We can go in there. God will certainly. But the 600,000, they couldn't see it because they didn't have the eyes of their hearts enlightened. They didn't know how to use the eyes of faith. They didn't know how to make the application. But God says, with the eyes of our heart, we can see the eternal and the spiritual and start making better decisions. Start making eternal decisions instead of temporary decisions. And we know where we are in our metamorphosis by... How much true spiritual life is, is now in us? How much, how much light there is? In other words, when I read these scriptures that I used to read when I was a babe in Christ, and I read them now, it's so clear. Matter of fact, it's incredible sometimes to sit down and read the Bible now and realize how much God has been able to do. And I hope all of us can share in that joy and that in that. Uh, attitude of just amazement. Look at what God's been able to do. You see this old drunk sinner who becomes a tremendously wonderful Christian and totally different. <clears throat> As the eternal replaces the temporary, old things start to pass away. Things I used to think things that, that used to appeal to me, things that didn't appeal to me, things I thought were important, things I don't think are important, all of that starts to change. Eternal realities become real. And temporary realities, they begin to fail. Short-term sacrifices for eternal glory make more and more sense. Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Now, if we believe that, we're going to be making a lot more sacrifices than if we don't, if we can't see it. Like Jesus said, if the light in you is darkness, if you think you can see, but really you're under the influence of darkness, why do you think he said that? He wants us to do a mental and emotional checkup. He wants us to think about these things. I like this verse. You probably know that. I use it all the time. I love it. These all died in faith. Abel, 
Enoch. Enoch who walked with God. And God took him. And by taking him, he was testifying that the life he was living before he was taken was very pleasing to him. I like that verse. It inspires me. It helps me to understand what's possible. Enoch is like that butterfly unerringly going in the direction and God saying, all right, I want you with me. I'm taking you. Then there was Noah and Abraham. That's the these all. If you, if you look at the context, Hebrews 11 verses 4 through 12 deals with uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off. How could they see them? Well, they had the same organ of sight that God has made possible for us. They embrace them and confess. They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In other words, the things that are seen are temporary. The things that are not seen are eternal. So we want the eternal. So citizenship in heaven replaces citizenship here and we become strangers, pilgrims, and exiles. Our citizenship is in heaven. Does that ever really influence us? Our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior. Well, there's a point that I can use. Do I eagerly wait for a Savior? If I'm not eagerly waiting, in other words, if I don't think about the Lord's return and it doesn't have any impact or influence on me, we talked about this the other night in 2 Peter chapter 3. Hastening, anticipating, looking forward to the day of God. Eagerly waiting for the Savior. That's what strangers and exiles do. That's what pilgrims do. Verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. When my, the eyes of my heart are lit up with that, I'm going to make very different decisions than I used to make. So when the light within us is no longer darkness and we see these things clearly, then we're reaching maturity. But if we still struggle with it, then that's showing us we haven't developed that ability yet. It's, it's an ability God gave us. The, he, by grace, he gave us the ability to have it. But we have to add on our part or it's not going to help us. <clears throat> so, with the eyes of my heart enlightened, these words resonate. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It makes perfect sense. Because we brought nothing in, we can't take anything out, seeing all these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy living and godliness? Or as Jesus said, make friends of yourselves with unrighteous mammon so that when you fail, they will receive you into eternal tabernacles. I understand that. And I don't look at money the same way. Money is no longer a powerful force to bring me what I want. Money becomes a powerful force to help God in the kingdom and to use for his glory, realizing, as Jesus says here, it's like putting it in the bank. You know, as a kid, my mom said, why don't you open up a bank account? And I'm thinking, what do I want it in there for? What can I do with it in a bank? I want to have it so I can spend it. Well, what Jesus is saying is you want it in heaven because moths and thieves cannot break in and steal. And much more importantly, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So those who sell all to buy the field in the parable of the hidden treasure, man finds a treasure, sells all that he has so that he can buy the field and buy better things. It makes perfect sense to sell all that you have. I'll sell my old car. I'll sell my old house. I'll sell all my clothes. I'll sell everything I have. As soon as I get the treasure, I'll buy a better car. And I'll buy a nicer home. And I'll buy, in other words, I can replace every. I, I won't lose anything. But the man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back 
not fit for the kingdom of heaven because he, he can't see. He's full of blindness. Anyone who would put his hand to the plow and then turn around and look back, they don't have, they're not walking by faith. So the eternal reality of true treasure, check your vision. Which is more important to you? Now, I read an article, well, it's been about a year ago now, it said, uh, if you, if God said to you, pray for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. What would you pray for? I thought about it for a while. I think in my 20s, I would have said, well, I'd like this and I'd like this. You know what I said? In my heart, I said, I just want to be right in the eyes of God. And I just want God to want me with him in heaven. That's all I want anymore. And I think that's where we finally get when the sense of eternal realities starts to come in. Who cares about health? Who cares about long life? Who cares about wealth or power or beauty or comfort? I just want to be pleasing to God. I just want to get to heaven. I just want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I just want God to reveal, as Paul said, in, if, if in anything you're otherwise minded, God will reveal this to you. That's what I want. So with the eyes of eternity, exercising myself to godliness becomes a very important part of everyday life. And I've, I've had sermons on this before. There's a spiritual gymnasium that we can go to. And there's powerful exercise, prayer, worship, meditation, reading the scriptures, there's methods by which we exercise ourselves to godliness. Have we figured out what they are yet? Have we figured out where our weaknesses are? You know, if you are an Olympic contender, depending on what your field is, you need totally different exercise machines to get ready for whatever it is you're going to do. If you're a runner, if you're a swimmer, if you're a pole vaulter, if you throw the discus, if you throw the hammer, you have to develop different muscles. Same thing with Christians. Exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Does that verse resonate with us? Is that important? Or here's another one. Do you know that your adornment merely be outward? Arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on a fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Ladies, when's the last time you thought about that kind of adornment? When's the last time? I, I look at this verse, if I was a woman. Now, what a dumb thing to say, right? But if I was a woman, I would realize every time I'm making myself up, I'd be thinking about this verse. This is important to me, but... My spiritual adornment is more important. I think that there should be a tie there. I think that every time, that I think that's P Peter's point. Don't let your adornment merely, merely be outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on apparel. That's not enough. Before you see the world, make sure your hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, I'll tell you something. In this day and age, that verse is an anthema. Most women don't want a gentle and quiet spirit. And it's sad. It's sad that our country is removing what it is to be a true man and what it is to be a true woman and the, the meek and quiet spirit which is beautiful to God and yet disgusting, apparently, to our culture. So depending on which organ of sight we're using, this verse either... I think there's a lot of people, at least in the denomination, probably even in the Lord's Church, who read this verse and just think to themselves, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Just like when Paul said, I don't permit a woman to teach or have dominion over a man. Those of us with the eyes of faith, we just accept it. We may not like it. I don't like every command in the Scriptures. But that's the point. It's the ones I don't like that are the most important that I do to prove to my God that I trust Him, that I don't walk by faith, Excuse me, that I don't walk by sight, I walk by faith.
Don't trust in my own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Well, as you know, I could go on and on about this. It's very near and dear to my heart. I think that this is important information. So from now on, when you see a butterfly, you start thinking, that's me. Where am I? Can I do what he can do now? Important things to think about. Like I said, that's what parables do. Parables help us to make applications as we see these things. By making those applications, the eyes of our heart become ever clearer and ever more predominant. As we open our songbooks up to number 501, the song speaks of getting mercy from God. This sermon has presented some very critical information to all of us. It is the key to spiritual maturity and to becoming one of the giants in the scriptures. Just like Moses. Just like Paul or Peter or even the Lord. Seeing we're compassed about by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race set before us looking unto Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. As we sing the song, if there's anyone in the audience who wants to become a new creation tonight by being baptized or who wants to develop their organ of sight by leaving something behind that's holding them back, a chain, a weight that they can't run the race with, we give you that opportunity while we now together stand safe.